Many, many of us are ashamed of fear, and we see fear as an anti-faith experience. But actually, fear is the beginning of becoming somebody who can trust and have faith. Fear is a feeling we have that lets us know when we're in danger. Okay? So if you're in danger, think about especially if you're little. You can remember being little. When you were in danger, when you were little, what did you do? You called for your parents. You did what you were made to do. You had to cry out. So fear is a feeling that tells us we're in danger and we need to cry out and reach out. For what? Help. And most of us are very ashamed of needing help. And fear is a feeling that tells you you're in need of help. So fear is good if it becomes a, a feeling that lets you do what you're made to do. Ask for help. Okay? So fear lets you cry out and reach out and receive. Now, interestingly, fear is a feeling that tells you that you value yourself. If you don't have fear, you tend not to value yourself well. I don't ever want to get on a jet with a fearless pilot. A fearless pilot isn't paying attention. They're not looking at the checklist, it gas in the plane. Oh, I don't know. Let's just go. Who cares? I'm fearless. I'm not checking in on the dangers or the responsibilities or the checklist. I want to be around people who are properly afraid. The beginning of uh, wisdom is fear of the Lord. Okay? Knowing the dangers, knowing what to do about them, knowing how to take care of them, knowing how to reach out, knowing how to live within the context of them. Big deal. So fear is good because it says, I value me. And if I'm a, a pilot who's properly fearful, I go through the checklist. I value me and I also value you. Hurt people who can own their hurt can care about hurt people. Sad people who value their sadness can have sadness about other people's loss. Fear-based, fearful people who know what to do with fear can value other people. So I want to be around scared people. Sounds weird, doesn't it? I don't want to be around shaky people. I want to be around people who can take ownership of their fear and know how to cry out, reach out, because those people are the prayerful people. Dahati prayed in the beginning, one, because it's the proper thing to do. But I say the man prayed because he's fearful, because he's after something good. He values what's happening here, and he wants it to turn away. So he beseeches the God, beseeches the Lord. And I was grateful for the prayer. Like, pray, man. I'm in. Because you pray for me. He prayed for me. I'm like, thank you. Because I need the prayer, because we're doing something big here. We're doing something that matters. And I want it to be good, because you're remembering this. And like my friend says, Go ahead and do it. Don't worry about it. Nobody's going to care anyway. It's like, I do not believe that. I believe this changes lives. By sending us back to who we're made to be, doesn't change and make us super people. We become people again in need of God. Okay. So fear allows us to be prayerful. Now, this is what's amazing about fear. Fear allows us to anticipate consequences. What does that mean related to hot stoves? Yeah, don't touch it. I anticipate consequences usually through experience. So I don't need to go there. Because if I go there, I already know what's going to happen. I've already been there before. Okay? So now, if you've already been there before, and it turned out badly, but let's say you're an addict, and it's hard not to go back to the vomit. So yeah, I've already been there before, but maybe this time. Exactly. So if if you have some fear... And you know what the consequences are in your head. What are you going to do about wanting to return to your vomit? You're going to say, look, man, I know I need to not go there. I know what's going to happen. But everything in me is dragging me there. Help me. Hold on to me. Stay with me until this passes. Do You see? So even, even addiction can be blessed by fear 
Just because you know the consequences doesn't make you do them, doesn't make you avoid them. But relationship, remember, everything's about living fully in relationship with self, others, and God. You don't learn fear so you can become strong. You learn fear because you can need better with it. You see? So anticipate consequences. You can plan results. You can practice. Okay? Okay. Fear allows you to respect reality. I thought a whole lot about all this before I came here. I may have thought too much about it. But anyway, I thought a lot about it before I came here. I know what I want you to know. Probably more than we can all do, but I know. You know? But I, I'm, I'm, I practiced in my mind. How many times I went through, like, how do we start? How do we start? I know what to do once we get started, but how do we, how do we as this group, God, how do we, I talk to other people, how do we start to really focus in you see so this is what fear can do for us practice anticipate consequences and uh, plan results it can get you ready for the game okay and then fear allows you to ask for help fear lets you hope ask and receive if i tell you i'll show up and i show up and you say are you sure and i do it what are you going to have after I've shown up and I told you I would and you hoped I would and you risked believing and waiting and I did show up? What do you have after I showed up? You have some confidence, some trust. You have an outcome that kind of favorable to your heart. There's the beginning of faith. I'm sure of what I hope for and I'm certain of what I do not see is what it becomes. But it starts out with I'm hoping and I'm believing, I'm risking, uh, will it happen? So fear slowly translates into, oh, he's coming. You bet I'm scared, but he's coming. I'm less scared than I was, but I'm still properly scared because I need to be prepared for whatever happens. But either way, I'm believing. And then we get good at a thing called wisdom. Wisdom is weird, but all wisdom means, wisdom is really pretty simple and it's essential definition. Wisdom just means knowing when. Wisdom is all about timing. When to move, when to stay, when to stop, when to go, when to speak, when to be silent. Who to talk to, like Jorge was saying earlier. Is that somebody I talk to or not? And you gain. So wisdom is all about timing. Now, what it really means is you have a keen understanding of human nature. Like we're going to let each other down. And you have a deep trust in spiritual truths. That's what wisdom really is. So, yeah, I'm going to let you down, and yet I believe in something greater than you let me down. That's wisdom. To keep believing in spite of the realities. Truth trumps reality. Truth trumps reality. And this is how we enter God's truth with our human truth. God, look, this is where I am. What are you going to do? That's what the Psalms are full of. Hey, this is where I am. What are you going to do? Hey, this is where I am. Are you going to keep doing it? <laughs> no, it's going to have to end. It's like, well, the darkness is my closest friend, God. What are you doing? It's amazing. God calls us to be his children so we can become his heirs. And children are always asking questions. What are you doing? Where are we going? When are we going to get there? Right? So in your morning journaling, what are you doing? Where are we going? When are we going to get there? <laughs> I don't see like we're making any progress. God, it scares me. I'm angry with you. It's hurting I'm so full of joy, God. I'm just sitting here thinking about it. I don't want to leave this room. You're filling up. Get prepared to go into the day. Now, if you can't do fear, anxiety takes its place. Anxiety is anticipation of something bad happening that has happened before. Where you were left, where you were rejected, where you got wounded, where it turned out badly. And your heart's kind of conditioned to things turning out badly. So if you can't be afraid and cry out, reach out for help, anticipation of something terrible happening is going to sit on you. Now, what's weird is anxiety is when your body, physical body, takes over for your heart's work. Where you're not confessing and living out of your heart, your body will take over. What is anxiety? Stomach, <laughs> breathing, <laughs> like, a, like a dog in, in the heat. Uh, thoughts, eyes get big, 
It's got a stress response it's called fight, flight, or freeze. You're like a bird sitting on a little rod in an electric cage, waiting, <sighs> nowhere to fly. Anxiety. That's what truly we think of as it's worry, stress, anxiousness. Anxiety is an inability and unwillingness to know what to do with my fear. You see that? Isn't it weird? And you guys, you're going to be anxious. Well, welcome to our club. You're going to be anxious and depressed off and on throughout your life. Here and there, it's going to happen. You're going to want to quit feeling depression. And you're just going to just, I don't think God's coming. I got to take it. And when you get anxious, does everybody get what I'm saying? About anx anx anxious is intolerable. And being anxious is intolerable. It makes you have to what? Do what? It makes you got to do something. Exactly. Anxiety is just like, okay, okay, okay. Somebody got to move. Somebody got to move. There are times I've been on airplanes. One time I, I really kind of got in trouble. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've been on the airplane as long as I could take it. And it, we stopped, and I was by the window, and Sonia was in the middle. And I said, Sonia, you got to let me out. You got to let me out. I got to get out. So I, she said, Chip, no, I got to get out. <laughs> and, and, and I shoved my way out. And this woman's going, excuse me. I'm like, I know, I know. I got to get out. <laughs> I, I just couldn't stand. I couldn't tolerate being on that airplane anymore. So it's going to happen. We're going to, but anxiety makes you have to do something. It makes you unable to sit and wait because you're running from something. You got to get out of there. I felt trapped. I felt helpless. It was very familiar. I didn't want that. I'm not, I can't do this anymore. Can't sit in this like this anymore. Okay. So anxiety demands that we do something to control. What well, Sam just said, we've got to act. You got to control. Now, control of what? Your environment. Everything around you. And you know what's around you more than anything? People. Beautiful. We got to get control of people's moods, actions. Feelings, uh, thoughts, those kinds of things. It's the kind of thing that makes you make up to the boss when you walk by the boss, say, how you doing, boss? And boss says, <laughs> and you go, uh-oh. It's anxiety and control is the thing that, any of you ever gone home and looked at your spouse and wondered what he or she was thinking because the face looked a certain way? You, you went, uh-oh, am I in trouble? <laughs> any of you ever do that? Okay, good. And then as soon as I find out it's about something at church that she's talking about, I'm like, okay, no problem. I'm not in trouble. <laughs> you know? And she starts talking, I'm not even listening. Because, like, I'm not in trouble. I'm not listening. <laughs> as soon as I find out it's not about me, freedom! <laughs> so we have to have control oh, over people's thoughts and moods and actions because we're terrified doom is coming. Because I don't know how to be afraid well. Hey, Sonia, walk in and look at your face. I get scared. It's like, I know, I'm just still back there. Just think, because if, if, if you give up on me, we got trouble. Or have I done something that I can't remember? I don't want to, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> when you can't get control of people, places, and things, you end up experiencing something that is completely intolerable. And that's where the boom comes. It's called rage. Rage and anger have nothing to do with each other. Rage and anger are far apart. Rage is about terror of fear. I can't take having to be afraid because fear reminds me of being helpless. When nobody came, I cried out and nobody came. Nobody came. It makes being afraid, which makes me want to cry out, reach out, and ask for help. Go well, on, oh, do it yourself. So people who don't know how to cry out and be afraid well are all drifting towards rage. And you can't be close to people who can't be scared. Now, when you're around an anxious person, what happens to you when they're wired up? Do what? Uh-huh. And you want to get away. Got it? So rage puts a person in an isolated position. And scared people who won't admit they're scared are scary people. And you have to walk away. Stay away. Anxious people 
put people in a place to have to be anxious with them. <laughs> and if a person can't confess their fear, you ultimately can't be with them except to counter manage their control issues. And that's just miserable. Do y'all know that? Having to manage other people's management of you. It's like being on a football team again with a coach. Yes, sir, coach. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So fear is a gift that brings me to the doorway of development of faith and wisdom. Now, faith is beautiful because faith is first hoping plus risking with the favorable outcome. Then it becomes a memory of what happens when you hope and risk. Then it becomes a certainty about the memories that God's coming. It's going to be okay. So faith grows. It's not something you have. It's something that you grow into. Then all of a sudden you walk in like the path of the, in the book of Hebrews. All those people, they're going to the promised land. They, If they were going to the country they'd already come from, they'd have gone back. No, they were aliens and strangers upon the face of the earth, and they, they could not stop moving where they were moving. They knew what they hoped for, and they were certain what they did not see, and they were going home. And they stayed in the struggle till they got there. They would not back up. They would not sit down. They would not stop moving forward. I'm with them. People of certainty. And yet they didn't have it in their hands. They just kept walking towards it. Something courage in them. Okay. All birthed right there. They were scared. I can't live in a land like this. I got to go to another one. God says, it's got something just in mind. Hmm. Now, let me, let me jump down here for a second because fear and anger are tied together some. Anger is often a very difficult thing because anger has always been associated with raging people. And we think of anger as destructive. But anger, true anger is a creative force. You really take a, a time in the chapter on anger in the voice of the heart. Anger is a creative force. It's a reaching out force. The most vulnerable feeling of all the eight feelings on this board, the most vulnerable, the most exposing feeling is anger. Because if somebody knows what matters to you, then they seen the inner self of you. Okay. Honestly, if I were really going to tell you the truth about me being here, I'm here because I'm angry. Not angry at you. I'm after something. I, I want people to know about this. Was I scared of coming? Yes. You could mock me. You can make fun of me. You can ignore me. I could fail you. You could, Dahadi looks over at Angie and goes, Sweetheart, this is terrible. I mean, it could just, it could be disastrous, you know? And that willingness to take a risk of a disaster, the only thing that can allow me to walk through that kind of fear is wanting to do this more than I'm scared of doing it. Anger is a creative force. Okay. Do you get that? Anger is going to show what matters to you. Stay with me. Other words for anger. Anger is a desire for something. Okay? Other words for anger. Hope. Longing. Wishing. Wanting. Needing. Yearning. Hungry. Thirsty. Other words for anger are all vulnerable words. I'm hungry and thirsty and desirous. I'm yearning and longing. I'm coming towards this. I'm reaching out for it. I want this. I desire this. I so remember when William was little, was maybe he was like 10, 11 years. Daddy, I'm going to do so and so. All these other my friends are doing. I said, William, I I'm sorry. Those, those friends of yours aren't my son. You're my son. You're not doing it. I watched his face. Something was struck in him. Not fear, but, but delight. Son, you're my son. You're not doing it. I'm sorry. But that you're my son. Not I own you. It's more I claim you. I'm after you. I want your good. His face went, 
He smiled at me, and that was the end of it. Well, that one time. <laughs> well, it's a great story. <laughs> no, but it, 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 it's real. Doesn't mean he always listens. Doesn't mean I'm always right. Doesn't mean I'm always true. But I'm saying that anger is a creative force. I tell the people at, at CPE, you know, the treatment place, you don't ever want me to come in this building unless I come in angry. Because if I don't come in angry, desirous for, hoping, wishing, hungry, and thirsty, then I don't care about you. I'm about protecting me instead of coming after you. But anger exposes your vulnerability. It shows other people what matters to you. And therefore, you made yourself vulnerable to being mocked. St. Paul, angry. I mean, it's just, God wouldn't shut up. He said, look, I don't care. Uh, I mean, I do care. I care so much, I don't care about the approval of people. I care about this God that touched me. Because, look, I know where I was. And I know what happened. And I'm here to tell you about it. I can't stop. Because when he said he was the chief of sinners, I don't think he was manipulating. I think he really meant it. I think he wasn't like pulling up, you know, persuasive argument. I think he meant, I used to kill people like me. <laughs> and he said, and this is where I was. This is what happened. This is where I'm now. And I can't shut up. That was angry. Now, the gift of anger is passion. If I had to put one word under the cross of em empty cross of Jesus Christ, I would put the word passion. Now, I, I remember making, I found a thorn tree and I cut branches off and I made a cross and stuck it in a cedar block. And I got a little, a little brass plate and gave it to a friend. I wrote the word passion in this little brass block. Passion, a willingness to be in pain for something that matters more than pain. That's Jesus. That's a mama. That's a daddy. That's a creator. That's an artist. That's a baby. Baby, they come out working. Let's go. Hands, head, heart. Let's do this. You, you come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's take me to it. I remember a Tennyson, my oldest son. I said, son, there's a pot. He, a rainbow came out. He's like two years old, has a Santa Claus hat and diaper, and it's like 80 degrees, 90 degrees in <laughs> Texas. But and it's June and Santa Claus hat, it's kids. And, uh, uh, it had just finished raining. The rainbow was way off in the distance. I said, Tennyson, the, there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And he looked at me and said, take me there, Daddy. And we started walking towards the end of the driveway. I, mean, what? I, I was just ki kidding. But see, he believes in me. It's anger. Take me there. I want to see the pot of gold. I'm going into my life. So this is St. Paul, Jesus, mamas and daddies and little children are made like this. But Jesus came and finished the job and opened the doorway for all of us to walk in security with our passion. We can go for it. We're free. There's nothing that can separate us from what we're called to do. Neither life nor death. Y'all know the rest of it, right? Romans 8, 37 to 39. It's for angry people. That's very different from what most of us have been hearing most of our lives. Anger is a desire for life that you let be known and go live it out loud. Okay? Willingness to be in pain for something that matters more than pain. Love and passion are very closely tied together. If your children think that you don't have passion, then they think you don't care. Impaired anger is pride. I am not going to be vulnerable. Depressing. Impaired anger is depressing. Depressing the desire for life within me. Anger makes us go towards and reach out and create and risk. If you depress that, you're pushing down what God made to come up. If you, I'm going to skip that. If you take a ball of air and push it underwater, so this is Archimedes' principle. This is one of the basic principles of physics or something like that. If you take a ball of air and push it underwater, did you know that it has an equal and increased pressure to rise? It, it wants to come up more. When you take the desire of your heart that's made to come out into life 
and you shove it down so no one will know the, your vulnerabilities, you're in conflict against who God made. You're pushing down what's made to come up and come out and make and do and show and share and care and tend. Right out of the book of Genesis. Go take, go create and go care, go tend, go make, go shape, go dig, plant, harvest. So depressing the heart means self-will takes over for the vulnerability of being known. We will ourselves away. Okay, so this is what the depressing, we depress our care. And when you depress your care, you become removed. You become a performer. And you become a fake. And then inauthentic. Never showed up. He came, he lived, he got a road named after him, and nobody knew him. Okay? This anger and rage are completely separate as far as the east is from the west rage has nothing to do with anger rage is all about fear people won't let themselves have anger is all about uh people who impaired anger is all about being afraid to care rage is about being terrified of being afraid okay okay and the gift is passion 